Hi folks, I'm Mike Hancock and welcome to our Sacred Ancient Wisdom series. Today we're going to be talking about who actually controls the world and does it look the way that we think it looks. In one of our other shows we've looked at words and one of the words I want to start today with is the word history which literally is his story. And if you've read five different history books on the one subject, then you've probably read his or her story five different ways. And they rarely say the same thing. So therefore, what is history and why is this relevant to us? What we've found through the work that I've been doing in the last 10 years is that most people don't live their own lives and they don't live their own values and beliefs. If you go into your values and your beliefs, think about money, for instance, and think about your values about money. Where does that come from? Chances are you'll hear your grandfather or your grandmother or your mum or your dad in that value of money somewhere. If you don't hear that, you'll probably hear a school teacher or maybe even what the media thinks. You see, as we go through our stages, from the Chinese stages of the seven sevens, so zero to seven, you have one influence, seven to 14, zero to seven is family, seven to 14 is school, 14 to 21 is friends, 21 to 28 is work, the 28 to 35 is family, again, 35 to 42 is wealth and exploration, and, and 42 to 49 is completion. When you go through those stages, you've got different influences. So are you living your life or are you living somebody else's life? You see, the Druids, the ancient Druids, they had a stone that they called Leophael, which was a king-making stone. And what they said is that they said that anybody who was initiated on this king-making stone was initiated with the knowledge for all Asia, ages. That is still what people are looking for today. There are still people in the world that want that power, that they know everything, to control us and control what we think and the way in which we're dealt those cards. The Stone of Schoon, for instance, S-C-O-O-N, which from right back from Elizabeth the first time is a stone that has been involved in the swearing in of any new king or queen through history, including Queen Elizabeth II. And again, it's got that relationship to a druidic stone and the stone of knowledge being passed the knowledge. The Zadonite priests were priests that came out of Israel and they went into hiding. They were basically, with all the turmoil that was in Israel around about the 11th century, they came out and most of them went to France and they had great money and they had great power and they had great wisdom. And they became prominent permission, uh, positions like the Earl of Champagne, not the drink, the region where the drink comes from, into the House of Depions. So in 1119 AD, when Hughes de Pions and his nine knights went to Jerusalem on their quest to find the king-making secret and find out how did they know? They knew because they were related to those priests and they were of Jewish origin that came from Israel in the first place hundreds of years before that. This is how the completion happens and this is how these sort of stories start to get woven in. So then if we look at what happened in more modern times, we have, for instance, um, going back to the late 1700s, a very, very prominent figure come to light. His name was Mayer Rothschild, M-A-Y-E-R Rothschild. And Mayer was born apparently into a poor family in Austria. He was um, an Austrian Jew. The Rothschilds are a Jewish nation and a Jewish house. And he wanted to study how to become wealthy. And what he decided he would do is he decided he would sell things of value to the rich so that that way he could learn from the rich and understand how to become wealthy. So he became an art dealer. And he dealt art and he started with smaller things that were like an art broker, um, fairly inaffordable. And then as he built his wealth, he got up to uh, selling great pieces of art, the great works of Europe to the wealthy of Europe. And from that, he learned something. And what he learned was, and what he believed is that if you control the flow of information, then you have the most power in the world. The most power comes from controlling information. So Maya had five children 
And when the 1700s turned in the 1800s, he sent those five children out to the five corners of the known world. So Nathaniel, or Nathan Rothschild, he went to London, for instance, and he was probably the most powerful and most well-known of the children. And something happened which tipped the balance of scales forever. And it was during the Napoleonic Wars. So it was really about Napoleon's defeat at the hands of the British. Um, and I think it was the, uh, the, the charging of the horses and, and the cavalry and everything like that at the Battle of Waterloo. And as we know from history, um, Napoleon had 250,000 troops. The British only had 125,000, although they did have the Prussians come in with uh, other troops very late in the battle. The British won the battle. What Nathan realised is if the British were beaten in that battle, then Napoleon would come into England and would make England part of France. And of course, then the whole stock market of England would dive and everything would be incredibly undervalued. So he needed to know firsthand what had happened. So he sent carrier pigeons with his people to the battle. And when Napoleon was uh, beaten at the Battle of Waterloo, those carrier pigeons flew back to England with the information. And then, of course, Nathan knew that uh, the English had won. So he spread the word totally that the English had lost the battle. Why? Because that way the stock market would go down. So when the stock market went down, then he and the family bought everything they could. And of course, in the next 48 hours or so, uh, word came through that the English had actually won. So nobody knew where this rumor had come from, but the stock market went up heaps. And at that stage, they sold, 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 making them the most wealthy family on the face of this earth until this very day. In fact, what they made on the stock market in that one day, even though it would be called insider trading today, is well in excess of a trillion dollars. And the reason why you never see families like the Rothschilds when they do the, the wealthy, most wealthy people in the world in the Forbes rich list is because if you Google any of them through Wikipedia, they're all worth about 200 million each. But every single one of them has a castle of this and that, that and the other. So it's about the family's complete wealth, not about one sort of Bill Gates character having 50 or $80 billion. These rich people, the super rich, they have trillions of dollars. When we come back after the break, I'm gonna be talking about where this came from, what the concept is, and then we're gonna be getting into how it affects you and maybe some things that you wanna look into before you just decide to accept the next thing that comes to you in your life. We don't do travel. We do profound life experiences. Welcome to Soul Journeys Travel. For more than 10 years, we have led groups of conscious individuals to some of the most exotic ancient sites on Earth. Machu Picchu and Incan empires, Egyptian gods in the pyramids, Mayan prophecies, Viking adventures, on the trail of the Templars, and even Asia's first spiritual cruise are just some of the spectacular individually crafted tours run here at Soul Journeys. Not only will you experience ancient wonders and sites your eyes have waited a lifetime for, our leaders will help you experience sacred circles, past life experiences, inner journeys, and de-engineering of your human programs that will assist you in overcoming undercurrents and blind spots that have held you back in your life. You will experience a deep and true wisdom, and at Soul Journeys, we share the alternative archaeology and research completed by our leaders that will help you understand that much of what you have learned and have been conditioned with is a lie, allowing you to make better and more informed personal decisions in your life from then on. Some of our clients have done up to eight journeys with us. Why, you may ask? Because at Soul Journeys, we design personal and intimate journeys for your soul to magical ancient sites around the world, coupled with brilliant leadership, wisdom, and coaching. Join us and have a profound life experience. Go to www.rockyourlife.net and click on Soul Journeys. Hi, and welcome back. We're looking at who controls the world. And I've just shared the story with you before the break of the Rothschilds and how they gained some of the wealth that they've got. 
As a funny aside, if you want to study them now, the head of the family is somebody called Jacob Rothschild. Go and Google a picture of Jacob Rothschild. And then those of you that love the cartoon show The Simpsons, go and Google a cartoon drawing of Monty Burns, the rich old guy in The Simpsons, and you'll find that Matt Groening based it all on Jacob Rothschild. Anyway, back to our early stages. We heard that these priests came from uh, Israel and they came to France and they became earls in France and very powerful in France. And when Hughes de Payans, who's a direct relative of these priests, went back to the Holy Land and with his nine knights found a lot of information, sacred information that was everything from how to build immense buildings that came to it from Egypt to certain alchemical things that um, were allowed them to understand banking systems and wealth creation, everything like that. When they did that, they formed the Templar Knights, the Knights of the Temple. Now, the Knights of the Temple are quite interesting because um, back in China, 2,800 years before that, there uh, was a document created where it had, was talking about the people of the most power and the people who were really the, um, the, the magicians. They called them the Magi at that stage, okay? And the symbol for the Magi in ancient Chinese is the exact same cross as the Templar cross. So this is how wisdom sort of goes across the world and is, is ingratiated in other cultures. So we have the Templar Knights now. And the Templar Knights, they build their wealth um, over 180 or 190 years. It's finally destroyed when the church and the King of France comes in and sacks the Templars. They go underground, they go to America, they come back, they're in Scotland. They create um, associations with the Scottish Church. They build the Roslyn Chapel and they become Freemasons. And there are certain levels and degrees of Freemasonry and there's two lodges, the English Lodge and the Scottish Lodge. One of them has three levels, the other one has 33 levels. The 33rd being known by many as the Illuminati, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. The thing with the, the Templars is that they have sacred ancient wisdom and this is passed through Freemasonry. And how's it passed, this information? It's passed in things like songs, gains, signs and symbols. We'll get to signs and symbols a little bit later on. But even if you think of your normal deck of playing cards, why are the 52 cards? Because there are 52 weeks in the year. Why are the four suits? Because there are four seasons. Why are the 13 in each suit? Because there are 13 weeks in the three month period. That's what it relates to. And for instance, um, the hearts in cards come from cups, the ancient symbol of the cup in the tarot. So there's cups, wands, swords, um, and pentacles, for instance. And this is the way in which information was passed through card games to keep it underground at the time. But I want to bring you to modern times. I want to bring you to a, a lady who you can go and look at on YouTube who's done a stunning two-hour video um, when she's in a, her old age, I think late 70s. Her name is uh, Charlotte uh, Isabite, I-S-E-R-B-Y-T. It's quite a strange surname. She was the secretary in the Ronald Reagan cabinet based on education. And in this particular video, what she does and what she talks about is she talks about a particular society called the Skull and Bones Society. Now, Skull and Bones came from Yale University and uh, Skull and Bones was was created in the late 1800s and it was every year there were only a certain number of people initiated in the Skull and Bones Society and it has many, many, many um, very, very powerful people in this, including the, the family of Bushes, if you like, and also uh, John Kerry and other people there. In fact, I was very amused to see that um, when John Kerry met with uh, Vladimir Putin's number one guy a few years ago when there was problems between Russians and Americans, that as they shook, they're live on CNN, shook hands, they shook hands with the third degree Master Mason handshake right there on CNN. It was pretty phenomenal. So uh, places like Columbia and Yale University are totally 100% funded and set up initially by the Rothschilds who I'd mentioned before. So this Skull and Bones Society is very well known. They have a photo taken every year with a grandfather clock at the back, all of them standing standing in the same position as they've done for over a hundred years. The skull apparently of Geronimo in front of them and the crossbones. 
The skull and crossbones came from the Templar Knights. It was a Templar symbol which they took from ancient Egypt and the burying of the mummies, which represented by the crook and the flail, um, which is the, the sickle and the flail, which is all Egyptian mummies and all Egyptian pharaohs had, has come right through to the skull and bones society. So this, what they're representing is they're talking about a new world order. And um, George Bush, the first one in 1991, said live on air uh, that they wish to create and there should be a new world order. And they're talking one currency, one government, one way of doing things. So it's fascinating that when you sort of start looking back at this, who is involved in this sort of inner sanctum? Now, you can't find out much about Skull and Bones, but what Charlotte said in that two-hour documentary, as her father was a member of Skull and Bones, and on his deathbed, he passed her the um, annual book that he got from Skull and Bones Society. And in that book, she points out all these people of power through the ages, the senators, the presidents of America, the, um, the, the people that are in Congress and, and, and business heads and heads of uh, organizations, big media agencies and things like this that all came through Skull and Bones. And she said that if her father said to her on his deathbed, that if he could had one regret in life, that it is he didn't destroy the Skull and Bones Society and what it stands for, for all time. And he asked her to uncover what Skull and Bones does. So Skull and Bones and no, numerous other secret societies, and the reason they're secret is because they put themselves right in the front there, um, are ways of controlling information, the cycle of information that we get around the world. When we come back after the break, I'm going to be sharing with you what some of that information will be and how it's gone around the world and what it means to you and I. We don't do travel. We do profound life experiences. Welcome to Soul Journeys Travel. For more than 10 years, we have led groups of conscious individuals to some of the most exotic ancient sites on Earth. Machu Picchu and Incan empires, Egyptian gods in the pyramids, Mayan prophecies, Viking adventures, on the trail of the Templars, and even Asia's first spiritual cruise are just some of the spectacular individually crafted tours run here at Soul Journeys. Not only will you experience ancient wonders and sites your eyes have waited a lifetime for, our leaders will help you experience sacred circles, past life experiences, inner journeys, and de-engineering of your human programs that will assist you in overcoming undercurrents and blind spots that have held you back in your life. You will experience a deep and true wisdom, and at Soul Journeys, we share the alternative archaeology and research completed by our leaders that will help you understand that much of what you have learned and have been conditioned with is a lie allowing you to make better and more informed personal decisions in your life from then on. Some of our clients have done up to eight journeys with us. Why, you may ask? Because at Soul Journeys, we design personal and intimate journeys for your soul to magical ancient sites around the world, coupled with brilliant leadership, wisdom, and coaching. Join us and have a profound life experience. Go to www.rockyourlife.net and click on Soul Journeys. Hi and welcome back. We're talking about who controls the world and who controls the flow of information. Before the break, I was talking about the Skull and Bones Society. They have their own island um, off the coast of Massachusetts and we don't know what happens, happens there, but those societies, like the Bilderberg Group, is another one which is in full view. The Bilderberg Group is generally uh, run by David Rothschild, I think, is the current president or, or CEO, if you like, of the chairman, I think, of the Bilderberg Group. And it's a group of people. When you look at the list, just go to their website and look at the list of who's involved in that. You'll see major news agencies around the world. You'll see um, Fastway Couriers, the CEO of one of those sort of courier companies. I can't remember which one it actually is now. As they you go, why is there a courier company involved? Oh, OK, because things have to be transferred between places and places of power around the world. Now, you can call of this a conspiracy if you like, but what I want to share with you is how weird, wacky and wonderful it actually gets when you start to look into all of this. Firstly, all of these ancient sects 
relied on signs and symbols. So for instance, in the book that I've got right here, you will see here the sign and symbol of alchemy. And you'll find, and we're not going to go through any of these too much, but as we go through all of these symbols throughout this whole book, because this is a book on signs and symbols, some of them call it, might call it witchcraft, alchemy, call it what you like. There's astrology, signs, symbols, and things like this. It's a very old book. But all of this stuff is used um, to depict things in a way that only those in the know will know. Take a US $1 bill. And I think Dan Brown wrote about this uh, and brought it into the public eye. It's basically designed by the Freemasons and it's based on a coin that was minted by George Washington in 1792 when he became president. The all-seeing eye, the eye of Horus there, which is a, a true alchemical symbol. The 13 representations of 13 on the $1 bill, the sacred number of Egypt. Count the feathers in the eagle, count the number of arrows that they're handing, count the stars and stripes there. Even look at the American Constitution itself. There are originally 13 um, different colonies and 49 states, 4 plus 9 is 13. Look at the American Constitution. There's many sentences with 13 words in there and it can go on and on and on. Actually, it's based on the Freemason Constitution. But this wasn't only in America. This went out across the world as well. You see, um, the Rothschilds had influence because of their influence in the five corners of the world. So in South Africa, um, the Rothschilds leader, puppet, call him what you like, was a guy called Cecil John Rhodes. Now, one of the few people in the world, I think, who's ever had a country named after him, uh, Zimbabwe, we know it at today, previously Rhodesia, named after Rhodes. Um, Rhodes, if you go to the Rhodes Monument, which is at the base of uh, Table Mountain in Cape Town, and directly looks out at the rest of Africa and just read the signs and symbols. Take a book and read the signs and symbols that are on that monument, built to um, Freemason Templar sort of standards as well. And for me, quite a very dark energy there. But Rhodes apparently is a good guy in some people's minds and a bad guy in other people's minds. But there is one thing for sure, is that they created um, and ran De Beers, the diamond mines. So the flow of money out of Africa was, was through diamonds. And the other one was through education. And this is what uh, Charlotte Isabite was talking about in her, in her video. I wrote about it in 2010 in a book called The Lie where I'd researched and gone back to the roots of our education system that's here in the world today. And it goes back to uh, around the 1850s where four billionaires got together in America and decided what they do, would do was shift the education, create the universities, the one spin. And some of them are seen now as the greatest benefactors to education like Carnegie. The reason why they're seen as benefactors is because they poured money into it, but they changed all the curriculums. And if, if you're old enough to remember this prior to the internet, and meaning no, no wrongs by any of my American listeners here, but when you went to America, they didn't really know where anything was outside of the world. I used to go and say, I'm from Auckland, New Zealand, and I got people saying, is that on the other side of the Sydney Harbour Bridge? Man, you speak good English. Um, you know, is that from Massachusetts? All these different things. It's because of that education system. In fact, even in California at one point, music was taken out of the education system, another way in which to control. Luckily, it got put back in. So here we are, we've got Rhodes Scholars. So if you're a Rhodes Scholar, you're being groomed for some sort of greatness. Now, Bill Clinton himself was a Rhodes Scholar. So a lot of our presidents were Rhodes Scholars. So it's this connection back to this controlling body of what they say is 13 families. I don't need to share who all the 13 are. You can go and Google that. But what I did want to tell you is about the way in which some of the control works. Let's have a look at two distinct um, big moments in history. One in uh, just around the, the, the end of the First World War, which was called the Bolshevik Revolution. And the Bolshevik Revolution, which is Lenin and, uh, and, and Trotsky, um, both Lenin and Trotsky were Freemasons, by the way. Tr Trotsky was a master mason. And so the, how was that funded? Because you need a lot of money to fund a revolution. That was funded, in fact, by um, a certain, by a certain uh, company out of America called Brown Brothers Harriman. 
And Brown Brothers Harriman um, has a lot of famous people in it, including Grandpappy Bush and, and uh, links to the Kennedys and, and things like that. Then we come to the Second World War and who funded Hitler? Well, we already know that Hitler um, had this sideshow going, uh, which was essentially uh, his search for the ancient works of art, search for the, the lance that speared Christ's body, search for the Holy Grail, search for the Ark of the Covenant. We know that he set up a, a base in Antarctica, a U-boat base. We know that he had another U-boat base in Argentina as well. And we know that he moved great works of art around the work and world and great symbols and great ornaments and archaeological pieces as well. But where did this funding come from? It came from something called Guarantee Trust. So if you follow the money um, around these two just situations here, Guarantee Trust is another American company allied with the Union Bank and, and a few other things that actually got money to um, to fund Hitler to buy steel that actually came out of America to build the war machine that fought America. And you, you sit there and you say, why would this happen? This would happen to create power, to control, and to undermine the way that ordinary people can create extraordinary things in life, which is what entrepreneurship is all about. So I'd suggest you go and do that research. One of the ways is to spend an afternoon um, like I spent uh, uh, literally seven days on a trip in uh, Santiago in Chile once in 2011 and researched all of this stuff right back and just followed the money. Once you follow the money, it's phenomenal. You'll see pictures of um, some of the most significant people of our time shaking hands with Hitler and doing that sort of thing as these, these deals are done. So what actually did was created? Well, and how does this sort of spin out underneath everything that's our world. Firstly, if you've heard of the United Nations, where did that, where was that created and what was that created for? Again, it was created from funding that came in from these military machines through the wars that then created this controlling body that was linked to George Bush's famous speech of a new world order. But then the other one I would suggest that you research and, and make up your own mind about is something called the Council of Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. Works with the Papal See, works with the, um, the British commissions and things like that. And the Council of Foreign Relations is really a controlling body that uh, sets down law that decides who's right and who's wrong. And this is the reason why um, right back in the 1960s, people like Saddam Hussein were told by the Americans, if you and a couple of your friends assassinate the Iraqi um, person at that stage, we will put you in power and we will fund you. And then once he starts breaking out of the American control and wants to do his own thing, boom, he's taken out by some of these um, orders and things like that. Another one that you should have a look at is things like the Order of de Molay. Now, de Molay was the, uh, the Grand Master of the Templar Knights who was burnt at the stake in 1314 in front of Notre Dame Cathedral in, in Paris. This is one small order of Freemasonry focused on um, working with young men up until, you cannot join this if you're over 21 years old. So you must have joined before 21. And you look at their, their role of honor for one little place and you've got people, everyone from John Wayne to, um, to Bill Clinton himself, to Walt Disney, to many, many congressmen, actors, um, Mel Blanc who voiced all the Bugs Bunny characters and everything like that, all came out of this one order. So this is what I wanna leave you with in this little series about who controls the world and why. The fact of the matter is that going back to Maya Rothschild, right back in the late uh, 1700s, who came up with the concept of, if you control the communication, you control everything. So my question is, who's controlling your internet, controlling what you're watching? Who is behind CNN? Who owns the companies that own the CNNs, that own the Time Warners, that own the things that you watch on a daily basis, that feed you the information that you are watching. I choose not to read newspapers, I choose not to watch news shows on television, yet I don't seem to be much out of touch with what's going on. But what I choose for myself 
is to focus on the good things of life, like friendship, like fun, like laughter, like exploration, and like truth seeing, which is what this show is all about. I'm Mike Hancock. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you again.